Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody. It was encouraging uh, to pull up this morning, and, and Ashley and I saw so many vehicles in the parking lot, and to see some of your faces, I see a whole bunch of new faces and some old faces, and uh, we're just thankful to be here, my wife and I, and uh, actually my parents are in from Massachusetts today, which is really, really great, so I'm glad they're able to be here and join with us this morning. Uh, my name is John McCoy, and uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 12, and we're going to be in six verses, okay? Those six verses are going to be verses 20 through 26, all right? And as way of good reminder, I'm going to do a bit of a review for us, because last week, if you were here and you've been following along, Jason uh, took us through what was going to be a, a tithing talk and some giving, and, and then really just got into our hearts. Y'all, I would super encourage you that if you weren't here last week to go back and to listen to that, um, man, that just challenged me. We so easily, um, these devoted things in our hearts and just what we've hidden from the Lord. And uh, I was just really challenged by that. So I was thankful for that. But prior to that, uh, Trey was in John chapter 12, right? And so he had planned to go through verse 26, uh, but uh, if you know, y'all know this about Trey, he, he couldn't get past 19 and then keep y'all here to get y'all out for lunch. So um, he stopped at 19 and uh, he told me, hey, look, you got, you've got the next six verses. So let me just catch you up where we've been, because some of you are here, maybe you've not been uh, here. And so we are at the Passover, okay? John chapter 12, we're at the Passover. This is really important for us. We've seen already, okay, in this chapter, Mary breaking the perfume and washing Jesus' feet with it, right? Okay, and so there's this idea, this, this symbolism already of, of burial, if we understand uh, burial in the Jewish context, okay, of perfumes and spices and those things. Trey made this wonderful comment when he was talking about that and teaching y'all through that, that Jesus may have in his day actually still smelled like this during this whole process because it was a really heavy perfume. It would have been beautiful. And then we see that Jesus rides in on a donkey. And we taught about uh, Palm Sunday and how the rocks would even cry out, right? That, that God would have his glory. And so his children were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Um, and that if it weren't them, that the rocks would have cried out because God was going to have his glory for Christ as he entered um, the city. And then we see, right, as we enter into our text, that the Pharisees have been clearly trying to shut Jesus up. They've been trying to stop the testimony of Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. It is sending shockwaves throughout their community, and people are coming to believe in this Jesus because of the testimony of Lazarus. And ultimately, we enter our text this morning with this idea that they're not successful. They're not winning at what they want. This thing is advancing as it is still advancing today, okay? And they are not successful in stopping it. And so this morning, as we look at just these six verses, we're going to see some things. We're going to see some evangelism. We're going to see some soteriology, some salvation, some sanctification. And my hope for us this morning is that we would be encouraged and both challenged as we enter in to this text. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read this text for us this morning, and then I'm going to pray. So if y'all would stand with me really quickly, I'm going to go ahead and read our text. This is John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. It says this, Now among those who went to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida and in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life for this world will keep it for eternal life. And if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let me pray for us really quickly. Father, We ask this morning that as your word um, is talked about and preached and gone forth, God, that you would glorify your name. We pray that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see, God, that our hearts would be ready to serve and to obey you through the truths of your word. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you have uh, given us um, everything that we could ever need in Christ. We ask that as this morning, as we hear that we would seek to obey, God, that you'd be 
glorified during this time. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Okay, so we've got a little bit of context, all right? We're into our text. Let's jump in. Verse 20, we're going to look at 20 and 21 kind of right out the gate, and these should be on the board for you there. So it says, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, I'm sorry, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So, okay, here's the deal. First part. All right, we see that there are some Greek people here. All right, and as I've studied through the text and even different commentaries, um, the best that I can possibly give you for who these Greeks were, okay, is how the word is used in that context of the scripture, okay, in its original language. And so there's two options here, all right? So there's the Hellenes, basically H E L L E N E S, okay, which would have referred to normally as they would talk about them. Okay, those who were um, Greeks, like Greek Greeks, not Jewish Greeks, but Greek Greeks, okay? And then they're the Hello Hellenistoi, okay, which would have referred to, um, and I may have totally butchered that, but those that would have been Jewish Greeks, okay? Because there would have been those in the diaspora who would have been, okay, Jewish Greeks, okay? They would have been Greek in nature, but they would have been Jewish in part. And so the best that I can give you for this is that it's most likely, based on the word choice here, these were Greek Greeks, okay? Which should probably indicate a little bit of, to us about how Jesus reacts to what's happening here, okay? Because they're there to see Jesus. That's what the text tells us. They came to Philip, okay, who's from Bethsaida in Galilee, okay, Greek place, and they asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus, all right? And these people, just to be clear, right, what they're asking for in our context is not like to see him, right? Trey talked about this a little bit earlier um, in, in one of the earlier texts, all right? This idea of when we see a word in, in the scriptures, we can sometimes take it to mean what we b- want it to believe, right? Like that word all. Does that mean all or everybody or, or is it just a general term? And so they don't want to just like lay eyes on him. They're not saying, hey, Philip, can we just get eyes on Jesus, they're saying, hey, look, we wish, we're hoping here to get a meeting with Jesus. We'd like to talk to him. I'm sure they had some questions that they wanted to ask him. They were stirred up. We know that the, that the whole region was stirred up because Lazarus was dead and they've heard about him being raised back to life, right? And so it says the tech, in our text that they came to Philip, all right? Now look at the dynamics that's happening here. These are Greek Greeks that are coming here, and they're coming to the Passover, which is a little bit weird, which is why some people would say maybe they were Jewish Greeks, okay? But in any case, they are Greeks, okay? And they're coming, and they are coming from, okay, uh, Greek places. And so they are wanting to see Jesus, and so what do they do? They find this man named Philip, who has a Greek name and is from a Greek place, And they say, hey, look, we want to talk to this Jesus. Because that's what we all do, right? Whether it's with jobs or maybe some of you uh, people in here uh, that are dating. It's like, hey, I kind of like her, but I don't really know her, but I know her friend. So maybe I can talk to her friend and she'll talk to her. And you know what I'm saying? Like we use our connections to get places. And so they know this Philip. All right, they're identifying him as Greek in nature, okay? And they're like, hey, this guy can get us in. This guy can, can maybe get us to see Jesus because this is what they knew. This man, Philip, is like us, but he's with Jesus. Right, like I can identify with him. Maybe, maybe for you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a similar job or a similar upbringing or something like that. But, but the identifying factor here is this guy knows Jesus and he's running with Jesus. And he can get us to Jesus because that's what we want. Man, we really want to talk to Jesus. And I hope this morning we can all be encouraged by this. As I told you, I'm hoping that this message encourages and also challenges us. It certainly did for me as I was preparing. Because I think sometimes in our lives we can get a little bit crazy with evangelism or just even living the Christian life. Like we can make a ton of it instead of just seeing that a lot of it's just loving Christ and being willing and, and open to share the things that he has for us. Um, 
But what we see about Philip, right, is that he was just running with Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was known as a person who followed Jesus. And so when these people wanted to get to Jesus, they just found somebody who knew him. And I don't know about you, but for me, I can remember back before I got saved. And I can remember when I first got saved. There were moments when things were either really bad or moments when my gracious, loving Savior was drawing and pulling me to himself that I just wanted to know more. And so I remember exactly the people I went to. They were the people just like Philip who were known for being and running with Jesus. They were clearly known as his. I had a pastor who I spent a bunch of time with, asked him to go to lunch because he was our football chaplain. I just said, hey, man, I know you're running with Jesus. I mean, this is what you do for a living, right? I had other people who were part of FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, or just people who were living it. But here's what I also knew. I also knew all those people who were at all those things, but everywhere I was with me. You know what I'm saying? I didn't go to them. I went to the people because when you're living in the world, you know who's really about it, right? It's almost harder in this room sometimes for us to make those distinctions and really, really have those conversations. But when you're in the world and you're outside of it, and I sure was, it was like, I know who's legit here. I know who really loves him. I've had those conversations. I've watched, I've observed because y'all, the world is watching. The world is watching. And for those in the world that God is drawing out of the world because he deeply loves them and is calling them to himself and will have all that is his, okay? He, they are looking for somebody like a Philip. They are looking for somebody that will draw them, that they can get them to talk to Jesus or, or they know has a relationship with Jesus. And so that should be encouraging to us that Philip was just following Jesus. He was just living his life. He was following Christ. He was with Christ. But y'all, I think that's also the challenge, right? Because the question that beckons us on the other side of it is this. Is this true of you and me? If we name the name of Christ in this room together today, does your job, does your team, does your community know that you serve the living God through his son, Jesus Christ? Maybe sometimes the hardest people are the people who knew you the best before you came to Christ. Those are sometimes the hardest people because you feel like a hypocrite, right? But man, you have the words of life. You have an eternal hope to offer them. So let's be challenged and encouraged as we look at this passage to begin with that God will draw his sheep. God will have all that are his through his son, Jesus Christ. And we have been called into a beautiful opportunity to partner with him in that by loving and abiding in him. And that that may be enough. Surely we need to have the words ready. We need to have an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. But y'all let us first be found loving and abiding in him and see what God may do and how he may use that in your life. So look at what Philip does, right? Philip has these Greeks coming to him, okay? And what's he do? He runs and gets Andrew because he's like, I don't know what's going on here. So it says this, verse 22. Andrew and Philip, then they went and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So like I said, Philip does what almost all of us would do in a situation. He goes and gets his partner, right? He's like, hey, look. This is what's going on. You're coming with me. So either way, he ain't alone because he doesn't quite know how this is going to go, right? Because Jesus wasn't sent to the Gentiles, not not initially, okay? And there's a situation. Yes, we have John 4. He's ministering to the woman at the well, okay? Awesome, okay? But then we also have the story, right, where the woman comes to Jesus and she's she's wanting to... um, to receive from him. And he's like, hey, the bread is for the children, right? And she says, she has this wonderful statement. She says, even the dogs will eat crumbs from the table, right? And that would be the Gentiles. That's what we're talking here. So they don't know how this is gonna go exactly with Jesus when they bring this up to him. And so they're just gonna ride and die together. Andrew's like, hey man, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's go see 
what he has to say about this, right? And I think it's funny, as I read commentaries, right, you and I would do exactly what we probably would do in our evangelical North American Christianity, right? Like if we were to answer for Jesus here, say we didn't have this text. It's like, I'll give you three answers for what Jesus maybe answers with, and you pick one. One of them is going to be the law, right? Or, hey, why don't you give him some gospel tracts or any of those things? It's like, no, 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 he just, he says something totally different. He's on a totally different place. And so he sees this and he answers, verse 23, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And I'm not gonna dive too much into that. Not that that's not incredibly deep for us this morning, but next week when Trey gets up to continue this passage, he's gonna, it's gonna, he's gonna, Jesus is gonna answer that question for you, okay? Here's what we need to know about the hour of him being glorified is. Up until this point, there has only been Jesus saying to his people in different situations, my hour has not come yet, right? Every time something's happened, he said, my hour has not come yet. My hour has not come yet. All of a sudden we have these Greeks wanting to see Jesus and he goes, it's go time. This is it. It's go time. And y'all, we're gonna spend the rest of this book in a short period of time about what that is. And it's awesome. The chunk of this book, of this gospel is dedicated to what happens next? We're in the Passover, and y'all know what happens at the end of the Passover. It's a wonderful story. But Jesus says this. After that, he tells him this parable, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Okay, so before we go into the parable, here's what I want to tell you a little bit about parables. All right, just bear with me. It's really important for us, I think. They are intended to say and have a specific point, okay? They are not intended for us to to glean and create a complete theology around, okay? That's really important for us. So as you read parables, as you read the things Jesus said in parabolic nature, he is not trying to get you to glean every little nuanced thing out of it to create a theology. I think you'll end up in some weird places if you do that as you read the Gospels. Very important, okay? So we get lost in the sauce when we do that. We get off track. So that begs the question, when we see Jesus give us a parable like he just did, okay, we have to ask ourselves, what's the point he's trying to make? So let's go there. The focus here, okay, is death. The point here is not to make all of the distinctions about wheat and how wheat can either grow and produce, you know, more wheat or be harvested. And we don't need to get lost in wheat. We don't need to have a whole sermon about the nature and the creation of wheat, okay? What Jesus is saying here, okay, is our application is this. It's about dying and the, and the produce that is produced from the fruit, if you will, from our dying, his dying, or dying just in general. And he's going to tell us what that is, okay? So here's what he's telling them. Application will come to us later, always. But first, our application is in Jesus. We always have to look first at what Jesus is doing, okay? We always have to look first at how this applies to Jesus because, y'all, it's always about Jesus first. So he's going to get to us, but here's what he's telling them. Jesus was not born to live his life to the fullest. Jesus was not born to grow to an old and gray age. He was not born to have a great career and retire well. Jesus was born to die. And he, like the grain of wheat in the passage, will die and from his death will come much fruit. Will come much fruit. This is one of the places we rest in this process. I love it. As I listened this week and studied, um, R.C. Sproul is one of my heroes and a guy I spend much time listening to. And he has this wonderful thing, like he gets into it. And you know R.C. will just jump off and just tell it like it is. But he says, when Jesus died on the cross and he is in heaven and he is sitting there waiting for the culmination of his church and how it's going to come to pass, he's not biting his fingers wondering whether or not anyone's going to believe in him. He's just not. He's not wondering, will they actually believe? Because he is a king who has paid a ransom and he will have his ransomed price. 
and none will slip through his fingers. None will get out of his eyesight. He is not up there wondering whether or not people are actually going to believe. He has died and God has promised that there will be a fruit and a harvest from his death. And it's coming and it's still coming, y'all. Jesus here is foreshadowing his death and he's telling us that though he will die, there will be fruit. Look at Matthew 28. It's up there on the board for y'all. It says, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Look at 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says this, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways you inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We have been ransomed by a king and many will be brought to life. The Bible says it like this as well. I don't have it on the board for you there, but it's Romans 5, 18 and 19. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It says this, therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, Adam, Adam's sin. So one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The Lord will have his fruit. He has died. He has first told us, this is about me. This is about me. And I will have all that I have come to live and to die for. So behold your savior, church. The one who died, the one who went to the dirt that we may have life. That's cause for worship. That's cause for worship, y'all. Him first, always, then us. So Christ continues, and he's going to explain it a little bit deeper. Here we go, verse 25. Whoever loses his life, sorry, whoever loves his life, loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for all eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a quote in his book, Cost of Discipleship. And it's going to be... uh, It's going to frame how we apply this next saying of Jesus to us. And it says this, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. In essence, that's exactly what Jesus is saying here, y'all. In other words, he's saying, if you want to follow me, you have to die. And to be sure, okay, just to be clear, Jesus is not saying here that you will have to go and you will have to be crucified like him, that you will die in that way for the sins of many others and that you will have fruit. But to be honest, if we're being honest in here, what he is getting at with us is probably harder than just dying physically because he's calling you to die as you live. Okay, that's much different. It'd be easier to just say, I'm out, I die, right? It's like an inheritance. It's like, well, I, I, I know what I'm worth on my, you know, in my insurance policy. If I die, my family gets it, right? So it's like, well, I just die and, and they get it, as opposed to living every day to try and serve them and to provide for them. They're two different things. And what Christ is alluding to here is our lives as we live on earth, that we would die amidst them. You see, you and I are lords of our own lives and we love it. We love it. We love our lives. Look at what the scripture says. If you love your life, you will lose it. Who loves their life? Every one of us to a degree. In this way, here's what I mean. We don't mind suggestions, but we certainly don't like being told what to do. You may not love the current circumstance of your life or the current situation of your life, but you like having control of your life. You like being the Lord of your life, just like I do. We are lovers of our lives and like the grain, if we only live to grow and not to die, we will remain alone, we will bear no fruit, we will be all alone. Each one of us is born with a will to some degree. And within our will, we want to build our lives. 
the best way that we can. We want to grow old and attain all that we can. We want to achieve all of our dreams, conquer the world. And what Christ is saying here is that you can either have it your way or you can have it my way, but you can't have both. And also what he's saying here is you're about to see me model my way because Christ would never call you to something that he didn't do himself. He's a good savior. He's a good king. He's a good leader. Y'all, to die is the only way to produce fruit. Our way is that we would try harder, that we would do better. You and I have been there. Christ is not calling us to try harder, to do better. He's calling us to die. And this is partly what happens in in salvation. You and I die to ourselves and we become alive in Christ. So I'm just going to go somewhere right here really quickly because I think this is really important. That's why the vernacular around our salvation is important for what it produces in our souls for truth. Let me explain. Asking Jesus into my heart may be the way that someone expresses dying to themselves and living in Christ. It may be the way someone is told or coached to express that they have genuinely died and they are living to Christ, but it is not very helpful in your ability to meditate on the truth that you no longer live, but Christ lives in and through you. You and I have sinned against the holy God. We have committed treason against a sovereign king. And as an enemy, y'all, I don't think we invite him into our hearts. Through Christ, we cry out to him to forgive us and and to call us as his own child And we offer our whole selves to that king that he may rule and reign our lives from that day forward. This is where Jesus is when he says that they would be found where he is, that his servants will be found where he is. Y'all, he is at the cross. Not considering what he could have accomplished in this world left to himself, but he is at the cross giving his life for us. And that's our beckon today. We can either build our own kingdoms and one day it will all be for nothing. Or we can die to ourselves. We can live to Christ and be a part of building his kingdom where we will have eternal fruit for always and forever. There's a verse that I cling to as I meditate on this that I think is really important. It's Galatians 2.20. I would encourage y'all to put it to heart. It'll be up there for you on the board But it says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Think about that, y'all. We die to ourselves and we live not in our goodness, not in our ability to make this thing right, but we live in our flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Y'all, we are dead and we are on uh, the cross with Christ in the way that he has brought us in and reconciled us to God through it. His blood has ransomed us. Y'all, this happens at salvation, but it also happens in the ongoing life of a Christian. Let me explain. Look at verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. At salvation, you and I aren't beamed into heaven. We know this because if you're here with me today and you call upon the name of Christ, you're here with me today and you're not in heaven, right? But that would be much easier, wouldn't it? At salvation, you and I are free are not free of every temptation of our flesh. It still remains a part of us, doesn't it? And oh, how we wish it wouldn't. At salvation, to be sure, we are born spiritually and we die to ourselves, but we are not dead physically. We still remain. Therefore, putting to death the flesh daily is an unending lifestyle of a Christian that we will sometimes win. And unfortunately, y'all, we know too, too easily that we will sometimes lose. We cannot bear fruit for all of eternity until we are born again. It is the moment in which we then can bear fruit. 
because nothing is pleasing to him outside of faith. And until we are born spiritually, we do not have faith. But once we are born again, we have an amazing reality in front of us. And it's this, that God is going to continue to shape us and to mold us into looking more like Christ and less like our flesh as it is put to death through the power of his spirit in our lives. And as this happens, the Lord bears fruit in and through you and I. And it's a wonderful gift to us as children of God. Here's what I mean. Naturally, you and I, if we're being honest, right? We'd never say this. But we want to be a million other places right now, right? Okay, here's what, here's what I mean. But we put to death our flesh. We're led by the Spirit and also the truth of God's Word to gather and to join here this morning, to sing praise together, to offer um, our, our praise unto God, to hear God's word go forth, to be changed and to be challenged by it because God's words command it. Because naturally, there's a million other things we'd like to be doing right now. Truly, right? But his word leads us and guides us into a better place. What about forgiveness? You and I don't want to forgive. Sometimes we don't even want to be open to our forgiveness of anybody, someone who's really hurt us. But as we put to death our flesh, what's natural inside of us, and we're led by the spirit and the truth of God's word, we hear the Lord command it. And we trust him and know that what he commands us is best for us. So even when we don't want it, we pray and we ask God for it and we seek it and we pursue it. I know Jason started out last week talking about tithing and and offering and, and some of those things, but then he went into really how it affects our hearts. But let's just be honest. There's nothing natural inside of you that just wants to give your money away, right? It's just not true. You don't want to tithe. You don't want to make offerings naturally inside of you. I get it, me either. I want my money. I want to keep my money. I don't like when the government takes it, naturally. I don't like when, when I have to give it to the church. I want to keep it. We want to store it up, and we want to justify every reason. We want to have all those internal arguments about all the reasons why we're justified in doing it. But we put to death our flesh. We're led by the Spirit and the truth of God's Word, and we find that tithing is actually good for our souls, y'all, just like forgiveness just like everything that our Lord commands us. We know that it's more blessed to, for, to give than it is to receive. Our Lord tells us that. And we're reminded that God doesn't need our money. He only desires that you and I would be free of the intoxicating power of it over our lives. So could it not be that it's for you and not for him? But we so easily twist that, don't we? Look at him wanting my money. Look at this church wanting my money. Could it not be about us? and his love for us, and his care for us. So like the verse says, right? We follow Jesus and we serve him. This is the ongoing life of sanctification in a Christian's life, that we, what is natural to us, put to death by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the leading of the word in our lives to do what is not natural, but what is supernatural, in that it is God commanded it, and it is spirit-empowered to serve him. It's not easy, right? It's hard. We know this. It's hard for you and I to do this. I said it before. We mess it up. We know all too well that we, that we ruin this on a daily basis to some degree or another. So we hold on to the promise. This is how we renew our mind. This is how we lead our hearts and our lives, not by our own willpower, but by the word of God. So hear the word today that it says that when a grain dies and goes into the earth, it will produce fruit. When you shun what is natural to you in forgiveness and say no, but you trust God's word and say, God, I'll follow you in this, even though it hurts and it stings and it's so hard, there'll be fruit there. There'll be fruit there. Like a grain that dies will produce fruit. When you call upon him in salvation as well, he will save you and he will use you. And when you serve him, he will honor you in that through Christ because he honors Christ. And here's the deal. I don't know or necessarily care. I don't mean that like, like in a mean way, how things may look for you right now. 
as you look out. Your current reality or my current reality is not the final say. It's not the final say. God alone has the final say. To everyone watching, the cross was a shameful defeat for Jesus Christ. They watched it. They saw it. They chattered about it for days. It was defeat, and it was shameful because only those who would be shamed would be hung on a tree. But in truth, it was the salvation for all of God's people, all of his children. It was the power of God unto salvation for all who would believe. So friends, as we consider God's truth, let us hold on to it. Let it shape our minds. Let it shape our hearts. Let us put to death our flesh, which so naturally wants to do otherwise, and pursue him because he's worth it. His promises are true. And I say for you and I, we should bet our lives on them. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity this morning to open up your word, that it would shape us, that it would challenge us, that it would encourage us, God. Lord, we have nothing to offer you but our lives. And so would you, even in the brokenness of our lives, use us. Without you, we're lost, God. You are a lamp unto our feet. You are a light unto our path. What is natural to us is bad for us. Would you lead us by your Holy Spirit? Would you lead us by your word? God, would we truly ask ourselves if we have ever come to a place where we have died and been born again? As we follow you from that point, would we seek in our lives to put to death the things that are only bad for us and hinder us from partnering with you in your kingdom for the sake and the glory of your name? And would we look to the cross of Christ alone for the grace and the hope that we have even in our failure? So Lord, we thank you that it's not about how good we are, but how good you have been, God. We thank you that you died to give us life. And God, we trust you that as we look to your word, as we die to ourselves, you will produce fruit from our lives. We have no business being in part with you in this, God, but we are thankful. Would this be our herald? Would this be our cry to a community and to a whole world around us that Jesus Christ is better? Jesus Christ is worth it. And we believe. So Father, help our belief. Lord, give us faith. Help us to trust you. God, we love you. We confess that you are worth it. Go before us as we go and use us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.